Hello, my loves. Today, I want to tell you about a, an idea that's very close to my heart and has been for a long time. Um, I'm talking about something I call cybernetic yoga. Uh, what is cybernetic yoga? It is an idea that I've been playing with for a few years now and an idea which I recently started applying to the Tirmular Siddha Yoga that Guruji Shivarajan is teaching. I was inspired by Gopal Chetty and Nalaswami Pillai and Paramahansa Yogananda and Guruji. Um, so this idea is a marriage of a little bit of Swedenborg, which is the tradition who I felt, who I grew up following, um, some contemporary neuroscience, and a very traditional yoga praxis from one of the oldest Hindu sambhadayas. The word cybernetic comes from the Greek word kibernetikos, which means one who steers the ship. The metaphor being that of a ship's pilot who can skillfully use wheels and ropes, chakras and nadis, to direct the course of the vessel. The ship is the subtle body in which cosmic consciousness is the director. Yoga is the art and science of learning how to sail. Swamiji once told me that the most important and essential part of yoga was the upward motion of energy. This can be equated to the speed of the ship. The condition of its sails and its hull must be maintained with good habits in order for it to make it to its destination. Cybernetics is a term from computer science, which describes the interface between a user and a machine. When I'm speaking into this camera, I am participating in a cybernetic relationship. A cyborg in popular culture is a biological human with mechanical parts. I want to expand the idea of a mechanism to include language and programming. I want to expand the idea of a user to any point of consciousness. A cyborg from this perspective is a being who is both phenomenological and linguistic, part real and part sensory. The human brain is a programmable substrate. We can readily observe this in dozens of experiments on neuroplasticity done over the last few decades. If you put a sighted person in a blindfold and give them a tactile task, it takes less than an hour for the visual cortex to start processing tactile sensory information. This means that the arrangement of the cortex is not inherent, but responsive to sensory stimuli. This isn't about physicalizing yoga. Rather, it's about recognizing the body as a kind of scripture. No one would mistake letter for meaning such as the relationship between the astral and the physical. Sri Sri Anandamarti called the Nadi channel streams of perceptual energy, which I love. The shape of perception and the shape of heaven exists on the hundred billion petals of the lotus of the brain Something that Swamiji said that really stuck, struck me was that you are born with Brahma's writing on your brain. And when you practice yoga, the writing of Brahma is replaced by the footprints of Shiva. What a beautiful metaphor for neuroplasticity. Causality implies time. I think that it's useful to look at the human brain as a time catcher. Our senses come into our brain 
through the cranial nerves and they come in at all different speeds. The brain has to take all of this information and kind of smash it together into a single conscious event. It does that by harmonically self-organizing, but also by organizing itself along a perception of past and future, which is perceptually independent of the external senses. The imprint of temporality can be seen in the very structure of the way that the brain perceives the body. The functions of motion planning are involved in forward parts of the brain, while those involved in perception of the body is further back. The furthest back part of the sensory mechanism is in the visual cortex, which is connected to the pineal gland. We can conceptualize the perception of internal photistic light as the perception of the back part of the waveform of consciousness placed at Bindu Chakra in the visual cortex. And pulling our perception forward towards the front, front of the brain, we can consciously attune the whole waveform to the speed of perceptual light. I think that synesthesia or sense blending is profoundly important to yoga. We have all of these sense organs and they all use certain cortical real estate. But given what we know about how, re how readily the brain will reorganize itself, when if we could learn to perceive our senses differently, we may actually profoundly change our own physiology, not to mention our consciousness and our perception of ourselves, which gets me to the interoceptive system. Why meditate on putting different energetic deities inside different parts of the body? Because that's essentially what this is. The interoceptive system is a sensory system like any other except being wholly internal it has no common symbolism and so very much like external language internal language has to develop its own systems of meaning from symbols found in the external world and they are divine these 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 centers that we're activating they're actual presences of of the divinity for from from the perspective of a yogi, the forces that are within the body are reflections and ripples in the divine pleroma, which extending both inward and outward completes the cycle of transcendence and profound imminence. When you move through the chakras, you're activating very specific sensory codes, positions, mantras, and mudras. They all go into programming this system, the actual product of which is the experience of transcendence, the visible result of which may be measurable to some degree in the gross body. The current consensus in neuroscience seems to be that synesthesia has to do with cortical feedback. So when focused on a given energy center, we consciously activate a series of sensory phenomena to achieve certain results. The spectrum of color within the Adaras itself creates an internal organization that allows logical progression up into Vishuddhi Chakra, where the senses blend as they enter the brain. The bridge point between the senses has the form of the brain as it perceives itself. The only problem is that the brain isn't on its own map. It has no nerve ending, so it is not represented in the somatosensory cortex. The interoceptive systems, which one would assume become activated when one focuses on a given chakra, are in the insula and the cingulate cortex, which are these sort of tucked under uh, bits that are sort of buried in the cortex. And because these are very foldy parts of the brain, it also means that they are some of the most unique to humans and a few other large brain mammals. The insula is involved with interoceptive awareness both abstract and emotional. 
when we say I love you with all my heart, it activates the part of the brain we physically associate with the heartbeat. What I'm suggesting is that when you bring your interoception up into the brain itself, you, it sort of short circuits our consciousness. Because everything else we've ever experienced has been a representation and suddenly we are met with a situation where our mental representation of the inside of our bodies is not a sensory representation, but a direct perception of pure awareness. The system sees itself. That is this lotus with a hundred with the 1020 petals, the energetic geometry of which is harmonically attuned to the organizing principle of the living connectome. Where everything else has been a reflection and an interpretation of reality, suddenly you are hit in the face with the massive distortions of your own subjectivity. The world becomes at, at once massive and tiny. Time grinds to a halt. And we have a moment of pure shining awareness. What you defined as past and future, the edges and the music of your sensory apparatus are a tiny sliver of actual reality. So the brain kind of traps time, sort of slows it down and manipulates its texture to suit the sense organs. But that waveform, that distinction between past and future, it keeps going beyond the body. So the point of all of this, the point of all of this interception of all this meditation is ultimately transcendence to get beyond the physical brain and to realize that we have been actually the collapsing waveform all along and not the vessel that was interpreting it. Consciousness, I believe, is a, a byproduct of time itself. And there is something about the physiology of the human body which allows that innate quality in in the the very progression of physical forces to manifest as awareness of past and future and continuation and ultimately that forward motion of entropic progression dissolves even itself and we discover that we can exist beyond time and space and form and formlessness and we discover that shiva what shiva is 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 actual reality um actual reality that our 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 mind seeks to organize into these degrees of karmic uh, progression, which descend and 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 moving outward as as divine influx is, is moving outward from from this one core actual real reality, it becomes more and more distorted. And what we perceive as the, the reality of sense impressions that is our normal way of operating in the world, what, what we are seeing is actually the most, the most distorted it could possibly be. Um, and so a lot of people think of spirituality as escapist or um, somehow trying to, to transcend the world. And I think it's actually completely the opposite um, that we, we escape into, into, into sense pleasures. We, we escape into whatever whatever we've chosen to distract ourselves today. And we spend barely any energy, most of us in our life, actually 
pursuing real reality and asking actually asking ourselves what is the realest thing what's at the ground of everything that i'm experiencing and maybe the answer is that it's love so that's the question that you got to ask yourself it's not is god real but what is the realest thing and you call that god so yoga is the process of liberating yourself from things that aren't the realest thing of learning to change how you define yourself And in my personal theology and in Tirmular's theology and in Emanuel Swedenborg's theology, the realest thing is love. And love is expressed through humanity. So that gives you a pretty, a pretty balanced way of approaching life is to constantly, constantly be reorienting yourself towards love. The goal is mukti, is agency, is freedom. And that is learning how to steer the ship. So we, may we all steer our ships with love. I highly recommend Shiva Yogi Shivaratan as a teacher. And uh, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Shivaya Namaha.